This program was made possible by the Jane and George Russell Fund and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. In the beginning, when all was fire, there were no stars or planets, no atoms or molecules, and no life. Eons passed and life appeared on at least one small planet orbiting an average star in a spiral galaxy called the Milky Way. On that planet, one species endowed with the capacity to think and speak has begun to wonder, did it happen only here? What follows is a report from a few members of that species on the search for life beyond Earth. members of the same ship's company, adrift on a planet that has nurtured life for almost five billion years. But while life is old, we humans are young. Since life on Earth began, the Sun and its planets have completed about a dozen orbits around the center of the Milky Way galaxy. And since we humans came along, the solar system has wheeled less far than the second hand of a clock ticks off in a single second. So we're young, but we're all so bright, or so we like to think. Of all the animals on Earth, we alone have the capacity to investigate how life began, to wonder where it might be headed, and to ask whether there are creatures on other planets who are asking the same kinds of questions. We can't prove, of course, whether there's life beyond Earth because we haven't found it yet. But what happened on a probably ordinary planet circling a certainly ordinary star and happened quickly, mainly the beginnings of life back 3.8 billion years ago, must have happened in many other sites in the universe. Our quest for life beyond Earth begins by searching the cosmos for the three things that terrestrial life requires energy, water, and organic molecules, molecules that contain carbon, the basis of life. Scientists are now learning that all three ingredients are not unique to Earth, but are found throughout the universe. Most of Earth's energy comes from the sun, but the sun is just one of a billion trillion stars. There's plenty of energy out there. Water is essential to life, as people have long appreciated. The Greek philosopher Thales portrayed water as the basis of all things. Confucius said, the man of wisdom delights in water. Human beings are mostly water. The cells in our bodies are little bags of water and organic molecules. Astronomers have found evidence of water and organics in the solar system and beyond. Mercury, the planet closest to the sun, has ice at its poles, as does the moon, and the planet Mars.
The giant outer planets harbor organics, and many of their moons are covered with ice. Farther out, swarms of comets orbit the sun. Each comet is an iceberg freighted with water and organics. The giant molecular clouds that line the disk of our galaxy contain ice particles that facilitate the formation of organic compounds. In this cloud, the Orion Nebula, 1500 light years from the solar system, Starlight plows atoms together, forming complex organic molecules and enough water to replenish all the oceans of Earth every 20 minutes. New planets are forming in Orion from disks of rocks and ice surrounding newborn stars. These planets incorporate the water and organics in the clouds, and their central star bathes them in energy. The energy that sustains life can come from inside a planet as well. On geologically active planets like Earth, volcanoes pump water vapor and carbon compounds into the atmosphere, making them available to living organisms. These veins of glowing lava are the life's blood thriving planet. Old volcanoes like Yellowstone, the largest volcano in the United States, are fountainheads of warmth and nourishment that link the geological activity below to the vitality of life above, on Earth and perhaps on other planets as well. From the center of the Earth to the far-flung galaxies, we find evidence that life arose from cosmic processes. The iron in our blood and the calcium in our bones was made inside stars. All the silver and gold on Earth, from the vaults of Fort Knox to the wedding rings in the corner pond shop, was forged by stars that exploded long ago, seeding the interstellar clouds from which the sun and its planets later formed with tons of diamond and gold. Terrestrial life is embedded in a cosmic web, and it seems reasonable to speculate that life is cosmically commonplace. Ever since I was very little, I wondered about how I got here and um, how the universe got started. I used to love to go out and look at the stars at night, and um, as I came to know much more about the universe, it was just inconceivable to me that we were all alone among all those stars and all those galaxies. Once life arose on Earth, it evolved in unpredictable ways. Biological evolution is not a plodding climb from lower to higher forms. It's a wild improvisational dance, as its history reveals. We've marked off five kilometers of highway to represent the history of the Earth on a scale of one kilometer equals one billion years. The Earth formed about a kilometer behind me some four and a half billion years ago. And the earliest fossil life forms yet identified on Earth date from right here at 3.75 billion years ago. These early life forms are sufficiently sophisticated to suggest that life had already been evolving for quite a while, but they don't exactly add up to Saturday night in the big city. For a very long time, the most complex life forms on Earth were these blobs of single-celled bacteria and algae called stromatolites. They may not look like much, indeed they look a bit like rocks, 
that they were the stars of the show for the next three billion years. That's three kilometers on down the highway here. It'd take us a while to walk it. We'd better drive. Even at 100 miles an hour, it takes a full minute to traverse the long, dull time during which life on Earth took few more complex forms than bacteria, algae, and plankton. That's been the dynamic of evolution here on Earth. Not a slow progression from so-called lower to higher life forms, but long periods of relative stasis punctuated by sudden bursts of innovation. The most dramatic burst of biological inventiveness occurred here just over half a billion years ago when a whole array of creatures equipped with claws and teeth and tentacles appeared in what is aptly called the Cambrian Explosion. Its cause is something of a mystery, but the forms taken on by nearly all the organisms on Earth today represent variations on plans invented during the Cambrian. Kind of makes you wonder just how exotic extraterrestrial life might be. The events that loom largest from our human perspective all lie along this very last stretch of highway. Mammals appeared 200 million years ago, just 200 meters back up the highway. Our distant ancestors learned how to walk upright there a little under four million years ago. And Homo sapiens appeared here. The whole human story lies in this last half a meter, easily overlooked on a five kilometer highway through time. Humans became big game hunters here about 40,000 years ago. They learned to plant crops here. And here they developed writing at first to keep track of who had how much grain in the local granary, later to record the motions of the planets in the course of human affairs. All recorded history, the rise and fall of empires, every innovation from the building of the pyramids to the invention of print lies in this last few millimeters. And as for science, well, modern science came along so recently, you'd need a microscope to see it. Never before has this planet hosted a species acute enough to find its place on the highway of time, to ask how life on Earth began, and to wonder whether life also arose on other planets. The search for life beyond Earth is the latest chapter in humanity's long history of exploring new lands and finding new varieties of life there. The islands of the Pacific were settled by navigators who steered by the stars across dark seas that must have seemed as vast as deep space. The circumnavigation of the globe by Magellan's ship Vittoria in the 16th century proved that the Earth is a sphere, unbounded but finite, capable of being mapped and fully explored. Scientific expeditions like the voyage of Captain James Cook to the South Pacific in 1769 had three missions, to map the Earth, to document the exotic life forms they found, and to help chart the realm of the other planets. In Tahiti, Cook and his crew observed a rare transit of Venus across the sun from a mountaintop site known ever since as Point Venus. They were taking part in an effort to measure the size of the solar system. By timing the moment when Venus first impinged on the solar disk as seen from Tahiti, 
and from another location thousands of miles away, the distance from the Earth to the Sun could be measured by triangulation. The relative sizes of all the visible planets' orbits were already known, so once the size of Earth's orbit was established, that of the others would follow. The exploration of space had begun, with planet Earth its first destination. Wrote the artist Sidney Parkinson, who accompanied Cook and painted some of the exotic life forms they encountered in the South Pacific. How amazingly diversified are the works of the deity within the narrow limits of this globe we inhabit. As specimens were brought back to museums and scientific societies in Paris and London, it became clear that these newly discovered species of plants and animals were, for all their diversity, related, that they shared a common origin. But if the species are all related, how did they get to be so different? The brig HMS Beagle was a 19th century spaceship dispatched on a round-the-world mission to investigate life on Earth. The naturalist aboard the Beagle, Charles Darwin, was young and inexperienced, fresh out of college, but he loved collecting plants and animals, and in studying them, he became the first to realize how evolution works. By combining the creativity of random mutation, with the editing power of natural selection to turn one species into many. Ever since Darwin, evolution has been the pole star of the biological sciences. Evolution's the subject that, insofar as science can answer such questions at all, tells us why we're here, when we came here, who we're related to, where we're going, where we came from. Old notions of evolution, of course, had it that there was a ladder of evolution proceeding from the simplest organisms to the most complex. But that really doesn't hold water because we as complex organisms would not do very well in places where simple organisms do very well, for example, in the crust of the earth or around submarine hydrothermal vents. All organisms that are alive today are exquisitely fitted to the particular environment that they occupy. And one organism in a particular environment is not very good necessarily in another environment and vice versa. Life isn't a ladder. Life is a selection for wherever that or organism happens to be. Darwin's theory revealed that living things and the planets they live on all function under the same set of physical laws. There is grandeur in this view of life, he wrote with its several powers having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one, and that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, have been and are being evolved. Well, of course, we don't know whether life exists out there, but if it does, I think it's a fair guess that it would have to follow the principles of Darwinian evolution. And that's because, let's say that somehow there was a creation out there of uh, circumstances that gave rise to life. It certainly would not survive under a changing environment unless there was something like natural selection taking place. We don't know whether life on other planets would be based on DNA or some different molecule, but we do think it would evolve along Darwinian lines. The DNA molecule, the blueprint for all life on Earth, contains a chemical code based on four polynucleotides that 
harbors all the genetic information necessary to reproduce the organism to which it belongs. It's a lot of information. A single sunflower seed has the data storage capacity of 100,000 books. It may seem amazing that all the millions of species of life could be encoded using just four symbols, but actually four is more than enough. Life could have gotten by with as few as two. The show you're watching was digitally recorded using a code consisting of nothing but zeros and ones. Critics of Darwin's theory say it's impossible to imagine creating birds or butterflies just by randomly organizing four symbols, just as it's impossible to imagine that randomly organizing the letters of the alphabet would give you, say, King Lear. But evolution isn't just a matter of random chance. It's also a matter of discarding the variations that don't work and keeping the ones that do. The variations that have survived are the ones that have promoted survival. So DNA forms a kind of history library, a record of perseverance on a changing planet. By exploring the lands and seas and studying creatures alive today and the fossil records of those that lived in the past, scientists began to piece together the story of how life evolved. Theirs was a great contribution to human knowledge, but exploration is a two-way street, and what Europeans regarded as the discovery of new lands often seemed, to those who lived there already, like an assault from another planet. As Captain Cook put it, how can these people see us as anything other than invaders of their territory? The English author H.G. Wells noted that the so-called discovery of Tasmania by the Europeans was a very frightful disaster for the Tasmanians themselves. How would we feel, he wondered, if technologically advanced creatures from another planet colonized Earth? Wells's musings about the dark side of colonialism resulted in the first modern science fiction novel, War of the Worlds. There they go. Giant arm raised, green flash, they're spraying us with flame. When Orson Welles broadcast a radio dramatization of H.G. Wells' novel, panic broke out among listeners who took seriously the notion that the Earth was being invaded by an armada of hostile Martians. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. Soon the movie theaters and airwaves were alive with tales of death from above. In the public imagination, space had ceased to be cold and empty. It was a jungle out there. When humans actually ventured into space, the search for life was seldom far from their minds. But where was life to be found? Our nearest neighbor, the airless moon, shows no signs of indigenous life, and rocks returned to Earth by the Apollo astronauts were sterile. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like m much of the high desert of uh, the United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Yet bacteria that were accidentally transported to the moon aboard an unmanned lunar lander survived there for years. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston, AOS, over. Houston, Columbia, 9-8, over. 
And so strong was the association of exploration with the search for life that when the Apollo astronauts returned to Earth, they were placed in quarantine just to be sure they hadn't picked up any moon germs. More promising as abodes for life were the Earth's two neighboring planets, Venus and Mars. They orbit within what was called the habitable zone, close enough to the sun for solar energy to drive the chemistry of life, but not so close as to boil off water or break down the organic molecules on which life depends. And it was thought that Venus and Mars might have hot molten cores that could power volcanoes like the ones that help sustain life on Earth. Venus was a favorite of science fiction writers who imagined it to be a lush, tropical planet, a kind of celestial Tahiti. Perpetually shrouded in clouds, Venus was a mystery. Nobody knew what was down there. Иной мир. Сколько раз за последние годы мы посылали сюда автоматы. С их помощью мы изучили атмосферу. Тысячи цифр. Но о самом главном ничего не говорят автоматы. А жизнь. Алексей, поворачивай-ка обратно. Сейчас. The real Venus would prove to be stranger than fiction. A series of unmanned Venera probes dispatched by the Russians from 1966 to 1982 descended through the dense clouds and landed on the surface of Venus. They found not a lush jungle, but a dry, hellish world, almost devoid of oxygen and hot enough to melt lead. Although the Venera probes were built sturdy as diving bells, each could take photos and obtain data for only about an hour before being destroyed by the heat and pressure. Scientists theorize that Venus fell victim to a runaway greenhouse effect, excess carbon dioxide trapping solar heat under the blanket of its atmosphere. Many questions remain to be answered about Venus. Was its climate once more temperate, and if so, what went wrong? Was there life there in the past? David Grinspoon is a rock musician and an astronomer who works in comparative planetology, using what has been learned about other planets to enhance our understanding of Earth. The surface of Venus remained frustratingly hidden from us for hundreds of years. In the early 1990s, the Magellan spacecraft, an American spacecraft equipped with imaging radar, orbited and imaged the entire planet in stunning detail. All of a sudden, we went from almost no images of the surface of Venus, except for a few of those tantalizing Russian lander images, to a global view in very high resolution of the entire planet. Early telescopic observers of Venus correctly deduced that the fuzzy appearance of Venus in telescopic images is due to the fact that it's completely shrouded in clouds. Pretty recently, we started to get modern scientific data about the planet, which reveal the clouds to be made not of water, but of concentrated sulfuric acid, better known as battery acid. Venus is alive with volcanism. Other than the Earth, it's the most volcanically active planet in the inner solar system, and the range of styles of volcanism we see there is stunning. For instance, these pancake domes are made out of a very sticky kind of lava. That tells us that these are not made out of basalt. Basalt is very runny. 
This stuff, it's some kind of lava that's probably more rich in silica and less rich in iron and magnesium and therefore doesn't flow as easily. One of the most surprising and controversial findings that we got from Magellan is that something radical changed relatively recently. About 500 million years ago, Venus essentially turned itself inside out with dramatic volcanic floods that covered up most of the previous surface features on the planet and probably flooded the air with greenhouse gases, causing rapid change to the climate as well as to the surface. This has perhaps disturbing implications because it tells us that Earth-like planets can undergo dramatic changes in both their surfaces and their climates in a relatively recent geologic epoch. And this information could mean that the Earth may have future threatening changes of this magnitude in store for us. Mars was the planet thought most likely to harbor life. It lies within the habitable zone, and its polar caps suggested even to early observers that there could be water there. The amateur astronomer Percival Lowell of the Boston Lowells thought he saw canals on Mars. He built an observatory to study them and speculated that they had been constructed by a parched Martian civilization to ferry scarce water from the polar caps to their thirsty cities. But the canals turned out to be an optical illusion produced by the brain's tendency to connect dots to form lines. To search for life on Mars would require taking a closer look. A pair of instrumented Viking space probes were sent to Mars looking for signs of life. Each dispatched a lander to the surface. In the pre-dawn hours of July the 21st, 1976, at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California, scientists and spectators watched anxiously for humankind's first close-up look at the surface of Mars. Fantastic! Look at the beautiful rock! What the pictures revealed was neither any obvious sign of life, nor a landscape as desolate as that of Venus, but a different kind of world, with a character and history all its own. The landers dug up Martian soil and tested it for signs of biological activity. The tests found some unexpected chemical reactions, but no clear evidence of life. Meanwhile, a pair of Viking orbiters took images that showed dry riverbeds, indicating that Mars once had liquid water on its surface and therefore a denser atmosphere, perhaps one sufficient to support life. Mars, Venus, and Earth form a trio of sibling worlds. Venus and Mars are the two most similar planets to the Earth in our solar system, and they're both very nearby worlds. So they present a wonderful opportunity for us to study the Earth in a comparative fashion. Here we're looking at images taken from orbit of the three planets, and all of these images show patterns on the surface which seem to have been carved by flowing liquids. The fact that we see these very similar forms on these different planets tells us something about the way nature chooses certain kinds of patterns to manifest flow. Viking confirmed that Mars, like Venus and Earth, has volcanoes. This one, Olympus Mons, is the largest volcano in the solar system. But the very fact that Olympus Mons is so big suggests that Mars is geologically dead. Earth's molten core drives plate tectonics. The plates that support continents and the ocean floors slowly drift, gigantic barges afloat on liquid stone. The volcanoes of Hawaii were built one after another from a single hot spot below. The motion of the surface plates carried each volcano away, rendering it extinct and leaving the hot spot to build another mountain in its wake. Mauna Kea, two-thirds the height of Olympus Mons, 
is the most recently completed of these colossal construction projects. But Mauna Kea has since moved off the hot spot and it will grow no more. Meanwhile, the hot spot is building a new volcano to the south, adding fresh real estate to the island of Hawaii. And another is forming on the ocean floor, destined perhaps to become a Hawaiian island of the future. But on Mars, Olympus Mons stayed put and grew to great height, indicating that the core of Mars wasn't hot enough to move the surface plates around. The extinct volcanoes of Mars are geological gravestones. Twenty years after Viking, another probe landed on Mars. Pathfinder touched down in a dry river delta and examined rocks carried there from the highlands in the days when Mars had rivers and streams. Again, no signs of life were found. Long ago, something went terribly wrong on Mars. The atmosphere thinned out and the planet's ozone layer, if it had one, collapsed exposing the surface to sterilizing solar ultraviolet light. The rivers and streams evaporated or froze into the ground. The possibility remains that life got started before this disaster occurred. If so, did it die out and leave fossils? Or might life forms still be there, patiently hibernating in the rusty sands of Mars? Just because life isn't conspicuous doesn't mean it's not there. This desolate landscape isn't on Mars. It's a dry valley in Antarctica. When the explorer Robert Scott discovered one such valley in 1903, he wrote that we have seen no sign of life, not even a moss or lichen. Yet there is life here, slowly growing microorganisms huddled in the frosty soil. Also to be found in the snows of Antarctica are pieces of Mars, rocks knocked off the red planet that later fell to Earth. About a dozen such Mars meteorites have been recovered. In one of them, researchers found what they considered to be fossils of Martian life. The evidence is preliminary at best, but it renewed interest in the tantalizing possibility that living organisms could have traveled around the early solar system, ferried by rocks that were blown off of one planet and wound up on another. That meteorite was not heated excessively during its transfer from Mars to Earth. That is to say, pristine transfer between the planets is possible. At the time of the origin of life, there was stuff splashing all over the solar system. I now would say that I believe that the origin of life is a common consequence of the origin of solar systems and that the real issue is does in that solar system life find safe harbor. Life can thrive in conditions harsher than had been thought from the near boiling temperatures in hot springs like this to the sub-zero frost endured by these forests on a hard winter's night. There are organisms living miles up in the atmosphere and others living in rocks more than a mile beneath my feet. Life needs water, but there are spores that when deprived of water can hibernate for centuries, reawakening when the water reappears. So with life on Earth found in places high and low, at temperatures hot and cold, it may make sense for us to expand the boundaries of our search for life beyond Earth. One way to investigate the origin of life is to look for places on the Earth today where conditions roughly approximate those that pertained back when life began. But where did life begin? On the ocean floor or up on the surface in 
volcanic hot springs like these, or in tidal pools with the first stirrings of evolution produced perhaps by the rising and falling of tides authored by the then nearby moon. And how did life begin? What transformed ordinary chemistry into the magic of life? There are really two possibilities. Either life came by some intelligible process of just chemistry gradually developing through steps which one might hope to retrace, or else it might have been some extraordinary fluke. If the process is a gradual one in which each step follows more or less logically on the one before, then it presumably happens all over the cosmos and we should find very many examples of life. On the other hand, if it's an extraordinary fluke, then we won't. To find out, scientists are investigating the physics and chemistry of the early solar system. The planets formed like slag heaps when boulders and gravel orbiting the sun were gathered together by gravitational attraction. Terrestrial life got started so early that the Earth was still being bombarded by cosmic debris when life began. The infant Earth was a violent place, its atmosphere a strange brew of methane and ammonia. Life has since refashioned the planet, making it more hospitable, and that's one of the problems about investigating how life originated. One has to think of the Earth not as it is now, but as it was then. Information stored in the genes of living creatures today suggests that life evolved from a single heat-loving ancestor, an organism that could cope with the volcanoes, sulfuric geysers, and meteorite storms of the early days. To learn what that ancestor was could bring us closer to understanding the origin of life. The heat-loving bacteria found in hot springs are among the oldest organisms on Earth, a clue that the earliest terrestrial life may have been nourished by the heat, not of the sun, but of thermal vents generated by the Earth's molten core. Black smokers are hot volcanic vents on the ocean floor. They host a rich variety of living organisms that get along in darkness, sustained by geothermal energy. Some creatures like it cold. On the bottom of the Gulf of Mexico, researchers were startled to find worms living embedded in methane ice. Life's three and a half billion years old on Earth. Bacteria dominate. They've always dominated. They live in virtually boiling ponds in Yellowstone Park. They live up to two miles down in little spaces and rocks where water percolates through. They allow us, as I like to say, quoting Mr. Shakespeare, to strut and fret our very short hour on this geological stage. And why shouldn't they? Because they know it's theirs and they'll be back. In fact, they're here right now. There are more E. coli in your gut than there have ever been people on Earth. So what do they have to worry about? The discovery that life can thrive in icy cold and hellish heat means that life need not have begun in a sunny, placid pond, as Darwin imagined, but might have arisen in the eternal night of the ocean depths, on Earth or on any other world that has oceans and a molten core, no matter how far it is from the sun. the discovery that we've made in the last uh, couple of decades that really motivates uh, the search for life uh, beyond the Earth is the, the discovery that life can grow in extreme environments here on Earth. So the habitable zone may be larger than anyone had realized. If the hot cores of geologically active worlds can sustain life in darkness, 
life could exist even among the icy outer planets where sunlight is weak. Jupiter, five times farther from the sun than the Earth is, receives only 1 25th as much sunlight. So Jupiter's satellites are cold, at least on the outside. Yet the icy surface of Jupiter's satellite Europa is marked by lanky fissures, cracks that suggest the presence of an ocean below that warms and replenishes the ice cap. Europa may have a molten core that keeps the ocean from freezing and that could power life-sustaining deep-sea vents like Earth's black smokers. We could find out by dispatching a lander to melt a hole in the ice and drop a submarine into the European Sea. The automated submarine could roam Europa's oceans for years, searching for signs of life. Farther out in the solar system are other icy moons that are cold on the outside, but may be hot inside. Among them Neptune's satellite Triton and Saturn's satellite Enceladus. Sending probes to these mysterious moons, scientists can both search for life and study the primitive environments in which life may arise. On Titan, the largest satellite of Saturn, a gentle rain of organic molecules is thought to fall amid conditions resembling those of the early Earth. A probe dispatched by the unmanned Cassini mission to Saturn was designed to search for clues to life's origins hidden beneath Titan's clouds. Jupiter's moon Io is a palpitating bag of lava. Scores of volcanoes pierce its grape-skin thin surface. The Voyager spacecraft imaged a volcanic plume shooting into space from Io, and so decades later did the Galileo probe. These two images of the same spot on Io show two Texas-sized black splotches of volcanic eruption on the left that weren't there when the photo on the right was taken just a few months earlier. Observations like these show that the geology of a volatile world like Io can be almost as changeable as the weather on Earth. We had expected these small worlds to be fairly old and dead and covered with craters, which is the hallmark of a dead planet that has had no geological activity in recent times. But what we found with these moons that get heated by gravitational force is that you can have liquid water in the absence of being near a bright star, just from being near a Jovian planet with strong gravity. The energy from the gravitational pull combined with the force of the, of the moons pulling on each other as they orbit causes them to flex tidally and that creates heat in their interiors and gives them molten cores and active surfaces. This gravitational habitable zone means that there may be a lot more real estate out there where you could have liquid water and perhaps therefore life. The potential expansion of the habitable zone here in the solar system implies that life might thrive in other places that had been thought to be uninhabitable. There could be living creatures afloat in the upper atmospheres of gaseous planets like Jupiter. There could be life on young planets still entangled in the dark clouds from which they formed, or conceivably adrift in the clouds themselves. On internally heated planets beset by the winds of unstable suns, 
on the ancient planets of old and steadily burning stars in globular clusters, or amid the fiery star-forming regions of colliding galaxies. There could be more life out there than we've ever imagined, for if the universe has taught us anything, it is that reality is richer and more resourceful than our wildest dreams. Life isn't fragile, it's tough. Here on Earth, life has endured heat, cold, and cataclysm, has emerged from the sea to inhabit the land and the air, and in human form has touched the moon. Someday we might carry the torch of life still farther outward to find a home on the planet Mars. If Mars proves to be sterile, we could make it suitable for life by transforming its environment through a global engineering approach called terraforming. Terraforming Mars would mean providing the red planet with life's three requisites, water, energy, and organic molecules. There's water there already. Human technology might provide the organics and boost the amount of available energy. In one plan, giant mirrors in space would warm the surface, while genetically engineered plants and trees replenished the atmosphere. Over time, the red planet would bloom with the greens and blues of life. Eventually, the air would become breathable, and the great-great-grandchildren of the first colonists might fish and farm under the blue skies of a terraformed Mars. We humans once imagined that we were at the center of it all. Science has let the wind out of that vain claim. Cosmic maps show that we live closer to the edge than to the center of our galaxy. And genetic maps show us occupying the tip of just one branch on what's being called the shrub of life. We're not at the center of the universe. We're not at the top of the tree. But then neither is anybody else. And we're home. We're part of the universe. And yet we're somehow also apart from the universe, able to stand back and regard it objectively as intelligent observers. But what does it mean to be intelligent? And how did intelligence originate here on Earth? Are there intelligent beings out among the stars? Will we ever communicate with them? And what would we say? Ours is a restless species, and in our wanderlust we have explored the Earth and sent probes to look for life on some of the Sun's other planets. But we're also a communicative species, and the way to search for life on the trillions of planets circling other suns may be through communication. If there are intelligent beings out there who want to communicate,
If someday our descendants have explored the solar system as our predecessors explored the Earth, might they then venture to the stars and set foot on the soil of an extrasolar planet? Can we sail through interstellar space as mariners of old explored the islands of the sea? Or is it better to communicate by listening for messages from space and sending messages of our own? Any way you look at it, interstellar space flight is a daunting prospect. It's pretty roomy out there. If we could shrink the sun to the size of just this single grain of salt, the Earth would be a microscopic grain orbiting it at a distance of an inch, and the orbit of the planet Mars would lie within the palm of my hand. The whole solar system, the arena of wished-for human exploration for centuries to come, would be within the reach of my arm. Yet even on this tiny scale, the very nearest star would be more than four miles away, beyond those distant mountains in the background. A futuristic starship might make the trip one day if we could figure out how to pay its titanic fuel bill and how to fire up its engines without frying the Earth and its exhaust. But any way you look at it, interstellar spaceflight is likely to be expensive and slow. But if there are intelligent beings out there on the planets of other suns, we may be able to communicate with them even if they're too far away for us to visit them. Our own boldest explorations remind us that the stars are far away. The twin Voyager interstellar probes, launched in 1977, surveyed the giant outer planets and are now leaving the solar system. They carry a message, a gold-plated phonograph record containing music and sounds of Earth for the benefit of any aliens who might one day intercept the space probes. But although the Voyagers fly 50 times faster than a jet fighter, they will take 70,000 years to reach another star. Ever since the Renaissance, when Galileo established that other planets exist, people have imagined that we would one day explore deep space. The astronomer Johannes Kepler wrote to Galileo that, given the right ships and the right sails for space, there will be men who are not afraid of the terrible distances. Actually, the right ships already existed in embryonic form. Rockets began as a form of entertainment for the Chinese, who turned them into weapons for defense against the Mongols. The Italians turned them back into fireworks. By the second half of the 20th century, rockets were being launched that were powerful enough to carry people aloft. In a series of steps potentially as profound as the migration of life from the seas onto dry land, humans ventured into space. The advent of space flight lent new immediacy to an old question. If we can travel beyond our planet, couldn't the denizens of other planets come here, or be here already? This signal, according to the space people, is a record of our 
planet's entire history being played back to us now at this time. We were finally invited aboard one of these spacecraft. And as I was leaving the craft, the commander, Soltek, said, soon others of your people will be able to have an experience similar to this. There were four men and two ladies aboard this ship. These men were business clothes like any of us do. The ladies were of brunettes and of a dark complexion. They had light waists, uh, dark skirts, and medium heeled shoes. Anyone who spends a lot of time looking at the night sky is likely sooner or later to see something they can't identify. I've seen a few myself. My most impressive sighting was of a V-shaped formation of oval white lights that moved through the sky silently at what seemed like an incredibly high speed. Fortunately, I had a pair of binoculars around my neck, so I was able to get a closer look. And you know what they turned out to be? Migrating birds, a flock of migrating birds, lights from a distant city lighting up their belly to make perfect little oval flying saucers. If I hadn't had the binoculars handy, it would have been a mysterious UFO sighting. It looked to me like a flying saucer. It was a great big, huge yellow glow outside. It was a big object shaped round, and then on top of it, it looked like a big cone with lights running down from it. It looked like a big cigar shape lit from both ends. Back and forth, up and down, changed colors, and then it just disappeared. The question is not just what we see, but how we interpret it. To claim that lights in the sky are alien invaders is like claiming that they're angels. It explains everything. And therefore, it explains nothing. If we can hold off judgment until we have better information, we can distinguish between dubious and sound propositions and between birds and spaceships. When a real flying object unexpectedly shows up, like this bright meteor which crossed the western part of North America on the afternoon of August the 10th, 1972, or this one, which passed over New York State on a Saturday night in the fall of 1992. It typically results in much better pictures and more consistent eyewitness reports than has any alleged UFO sighting. Yet millions of people still believe that UFOs are alien spaceships. Why? Perhaps because we tend to project our deepest hopes and fears onto the sky imagining that the aliens are warlike and dangerous, or that they're angelic benefactors who've come to save us from ourselves. Your choice is simple. Join us and live in peace, or pursue your present course and face obliteration. We shall be waiting for your answer. The decision rests with you. No one has come to rescue us. And it's unlikely that anyone will show up soon. And that fact may be telling us something. That the best way to get in touch with intelligent extraterrestrials is not exploration, but communication. By sending not starships, but electronic signals across the interstellar seas. The idea of communicating with extraterrestrials had been in the air since the 19th century when scientists suggested that we signal the Martians on a night when Mars passes near the Earth. Their proposal was to dig a giant triangle in Siberia, flood it with kerosene, and set the trenches afire. The Martians would recognize the triangle as a symbol of Euclidean geometry, a sure sign of intelligent life on Earth. In a modern version of the Flaming Triangle, the Chinese artist Sai Guashun ignited a 10,000-meter-long gunpowder fuse extended from one end of the Great Wall of China. He called the installation Project for Extraterrestrials.
Sai's work reinvents the partnership of fireworks and exploration. But for sending real messages through space, radio communication works better. Radio can carry words, numbers, and pictures cheaply and at the velocity of light. The almost miraculous speed with which radio carries messages prompted even the earliest pioneers of radio technology to imagine using this wonderful new device to communicate with other worlds. Guillermo Marconi, inventor of radio, picked up what he thought might be radio pulses from space. Nikola Tesla claimed that he too had received extraterrestrial signals. Tesla generated powerful electrical bursts at his laboratory in Colorado Springs and fancied that the resulting radio noise could be received on other planets. These imagined receptions were replaced by the real thing in 1931 when a Bell Telephone Company engineer named Carl Jansky accidentally detected the radio energy emitted naturally by clouds of hydrogen gas in the Milky Way. Grote Reber, an amateur radio enthusiast, then built the world's first true radio telescope. A metal dish, 31 feet in diameter, in the backyard of his home in Wheaton, Illinois, and used it to map the Milky Way. Today, radio telescopes record the murmur of interstellar gas clouds, the pulses of rapidly spinning neutron stars, and the screams of colliding galaxies. We humans have been inadvertently broadcasting to the stars for decades. The program you're watching is one such broadcast, it will reach the planet Saturn in an hour and a half and continue on into deep space. A sphere of radio and TV broadcast surrounds our planet. Its radius is nearly 100 light years and is expanding at the speed of light. A thousand stars lie in the sphere of radio and television broadcasts that have leaked into space from Earth. And if there are any listeners out there, they could, in theory, intercept these broadcasts. The farther they are from us, the older the news that they're receiving. Alpha Centauri is a star only four light years away, so Earth's broadcasts reaching Alpha Centauri today are only four years old. So brother, have you wondered about the human race? We're part of the continuum of time and space. The star Capella is 40 light years away. So if anybody's listening there, the latest music they're hearing from Earth and the hits of the fifth. Just take my baby to dancing on a Saturday night. The golden age of jazz is just dawning at Beta Picturus, a star that shows evidence of having planets forming around it. Sweet one so mild, you're my golden child. If there are any radio buffs at Mizar, a star in the handle of the Big Dipper, they're in a position to just about now be picking up Earth's very first radio broadcast. If we're leaking radio messages into space, the inhabitants of other planets, if they exist, might be doing the same thing. Large radio telescopes on Earth could detect such radio leaks from civilizations in nearby star systems, as well as stronger signals dispatched from planets thousands of light years away. This realization is the keystone of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. We're looking for signals from extraterrestrials, but we don't know where they're transmitting. Uh, long waves, is it short waves, is it microwaves, is it infrared or optical? You can look at this problem and ask, um, at what wavelength is communication most efficient, at what wavelength is the background minimum? In a region of around 1 to 100 gigahertz, the galaxy is extremely quiet and you can hear a pin drop. It's a very good wavelength region to communicate, and that's where this search happens to be operating.
Here we are. Can we be the only ones? Implausible. In fact, in my humble opinion, impossible. 400 billion stars in our galaxy alone. Many of them undoubtedly have planetary systems as we're just beginning to discover as we have the instruments to do it. 400 billion stars in our galaxy, 50 billion other galaxies. What are the chances in 400 billion stars, 50 billion galaxies, one, one, one intelligent civilization, and guess what? We're it. Completely impossible. Some scientists doubt that there are any intelligent beings out there. One of their arguments is called Fermi's question. It's named for the Italian physicist Enrico Fermi, who asked, where are they? His point was that technologically advanced aliens, if they exist, should have visited Earth already. Since they evidently have not, they don't exist. I performed an experiment to test the validity of Fermi's question. At home alone one night, I decided to have lobster for dinner. So I set a place, opened the door to the street, and waited for a lobster to show up and crawl onto my plate. Hours passed. At 11 p.m. I ended the experiment. No lobster had appeared, so I concluded there are no lobster on Earth. Since we know that lobster do exist, clearly there was something wrong with my reasoning. The error was, of course, that I'd failed to take the lobster's preferences into account. Lobster have their own agenda. They don't want to come to my house. But the fact that they don't show up doesn't mean they don't exist. As the SETI scientists like to say, absence of evidence isn't evidence of absence. Suppose we had an atlas that devoted but one page to each planet in the Milky Way galaxy. That's a lot of planets. Just a page once through all its volumes, glancing at one planet per second, day and night, would take 10,000 years. As the historian Thomas Carlyle said, contemplating the prospect of billions of worlds, if they be inhabited, what a scope for folly. If they not be inhabited, what a waste of space. At astronomical observatories like this one, on the island of Hawaii, Astronomers are finding evidence of planets orbiting nearby stars. We only want to know two things. What fraction of stars have planets, and what fraction of those planetary systems are similar to our own solar system? It wasn't until the early part of the century that it even became technically feasible to begin looking for planets around other stars. Uh, we want to do the star that's four arc seconds north. Our technique involves watching a star to see how it is gravitationally pulled by its attendant planets. And an Earth-like planet is simply too small to yank around its host star. But a Jupiter, being some 300 times more massive than an Earth-like planet, does have enough gravitational oomph to yank its star around. And so for the moment, all we can detect are Jupiters and maybe Saturn-like planets. We watch the star night after night, month after month, and if the star does wobble, it must be doing so because a planet is pulling on it. It's a little bit like a dog owner having a little poodle on the end of a leash. The poodle, being very low mass, can still yank its owner around if the poodle goes around in circles. Uh, and in this case, the low mass planets can yank around the star. In the case of a poodle, of course, uh, the leash is this uh, leather tether in the case of the planets, the leash is gravity.
Okay, Gary, after this star, we're gonna go a little wacky. We're gonna do one of these super bright B stars. Moving to S122446. Yes. We look for very teeny shifts in the spectrum that tell us that, in fact, the star is wobbling in space. It is moving alternately towards us and away from us. If the star is moving towards you, its entire spectrum will be shifted to the blue, and if the star is moving away from you, then the star will be shifted to the red. Paul, we're on target. Probably the most exciting endeavor that Paul and I are engaged in is the detection of additional planets to stars for which we've already detected one planet. And this would be very exciting, you see, because finding just one planet around a star seems not just lonely in the emotional sense, but it renders the system architecturally different from our own solar system, which of course has nine planets. So the question is, are there other planetary systems out there with a plural that have multiple planets. And until we find one with multiple planets, we have not actually found kin of our own solar system. The question of how we would detect life on another planet without actually going there is a, a really interesting one. There are, are some people, of course, who will only be convinced if we can actually image continents and oceans on another body. And that, that's a, an admirable goal, and that's where we eventually want to get to, for sure. But that's going to take a tremendous amount of technology development to get to that point, because there are vast different, uh, distances between us and uh, the nearest stars and their planetary systems. I mean, we're not there yet, but we are taking the steps so that we will have a picture in the next uh, 10, 15, or 20 years of another planet that is as compelling as the Apollo 17 picture of the Earth in space. future telescopes operating in space could be linked together to create the equivalent of a lens larger than the Earth. Such orbiting observatories might be able to detect signs of life on the planets of nearby stars. Telescopes have incited speculation about extraterrestrial life ever since the summer nights 400 years ago when Galileo first trained a telescope on the sky. Galileo, who lived uh, just down the hill here, called the universe a great book written in the characters of geometrical figures. This was a revolutionary idea. The books that mattered in Galileo's day were those written by the ancient authorities, people like Aristotle and Ptolemy. They said that the universe was a kind of nutshell with the earth at its center, and the sun and planets were ethereal wafers pasted on the inside of the shell. In that kind of universe, there could be no life on other worlds because there were no other worlds. The stars and planets were like the decorations on the insides of the great cathedrals, beautiful, pristine, nearby, and almost perfectly useless. But when Galileo turned a telescope on the sky, he found that the planets and the moon didn't look like wafers, they looked like rotund worlds resembling the earth in some ways. And when he looked at the sun, he found that it wasn't perfect, but besmirched by sunspots. Here's a sunspot here, this one's bigger than the earth. As Galileo observed the sun here in Florence from week after week, he could see these sunspots, which are giant magnetic storms on the surface of the sun, moving across 
not the behavior of a flat, static object, but as we would say today, of a rotating ball of plasma, a star. Galileo's observations blew the roof off the universe. Aristotle to the contrary, the Earth is not the only world bound in a starry nutshell. It's one among many worlds, and there's no nutshell at all. The sun is a star. Every star is a sun. The mathematical laws of nature that pertain here on Earth work everywhere else as well. And if there's life here, why not out there? Galileo's experiments touched off a scientific revolution that awakened humankind to the possibility of life beyond Earth. In Germany, Johannes Kepler identified the laws that govern the motion of the planets. Kepler found that the planets move faster when close to the sun and slower when farther away, in just such a way that their orbits always sweep out equal areas in equal times. This is a genuinely universal law, true of any object in orbit, from the moons of Jupiter to the planets of distant stars. In England, Isaac Newton showed that Kepler's laws result from the force of gravitation exerted by the Earth and every other massive object everywhere. It is by using Newton's equations that today's space navigators are able to put probes into orbit around Venus, Mars, and Jupiter. In the 20th century, Albert Einstein cleared up disparities in Newton's theory by composing a broader account of gravitation, the general theory of relativity. Relativity implied that cosmic space is expanding. The idea seemed so outlandish that Einstein himself rejected it, but big new telescopes were being built and astronomers using them were able to identify individual stars in other galaxies and determine that they obey the same physical laws that pertain here on Earth. In 1929, the American astronomer Edwin Hubble without knowing that relativity implied that the universe expands, discovered that the distant galaxies are indeed moving apart from one another, just as Einstein's theory had predicted. Less than four centuries after Galileo, humans had learned that the universe is all of a piece, expanding and evolving in accordance with one set of physical laws. Living creatures are made of the same stuff as are the stars and planets, and they obey the same laws. And so, in theory, life could exist all over the universe. There are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand at the seashore. And our human desire to communicate runs so deep that we're willing to send messages even though we're not sure who might receive them. What is life like on your planet? Do you have a pet? Do you have any special abilities like zapping people? Do you have any friends? Do you speak in different languages? Konnichiwa. Les étoiles sont le bord de gaz de fou. Do you have wars? Excuse me, I don't have time. <laughs> 
Today we have the means to send messages to the planets of other stars. But is anyone listening? If we are to communicate with the inhabitants of other worlds, there must be creatures out there who have language, radio technology, and the ability to keep transmitting for centuries at a time so that their signals can cover hundreds of light years of interstellar space. Yet we don't know how we learn to use language, or how long we may be able to listen for messages from the stars. If we understood how intelligence arose on Earth, we'd have a better idea of how often intelligence arises on other planets. The size of our ancestors' brains more than doubled during the past two million years, but nobody knows quite why. Somewhere along the line, about 50,000 years ago, human speech advanced from grunts and warning cries to the use of words as abstractions, capable of probing beyond the realm of immediate experience. In much the same way that prehistoric painters brought the daylit world into the darkness of caves, ancient poets painted word pictures of events remote in space and time. From that point on, evolution began to select not just for brute force and endurance, but for abstract intelligence as well. Nobody knows just when this happened or how. Until we do, it's going to be difficult to estimate how often intelligence has arisen on other planets. Once our ancestors could make sentences, they could make plans. <laughs> In hunting and warfare, the balance began to shift from strength to strategy, with strategy tending to win out in the end. As Abraham Lincoln put it, force is all conquering, but its victories are short-lived. Language is the key to communication. Symbolic language enables us to do mathematics, describe events that happened far away, and make a lasting record of our thoughts and feelings. If we're to communicate with extraterrestrials, they too must be able to manipulate symbols. To search for intelligent life in the universe is, therefore, to search for another species similarly endowed with an aptitude for symbolic language. Because if they don't have language, they may be smart, but we're not apt to hear from them. Creatures lacking a symbolic language cannot send complex messages through space or much of anywhere else. They can cry out an alarm or coo tenderly to their young, but they can't tell someone far away about their planet, their history, or their science. Indeed, without language, they can't have any real history or science. In that sense, looking for intelligent extraterrestrials means looking for beings rather like ourselves. Not that they'd resemble us physically, of course, or speak in a human tongue. But they would, by definition, have language. And where there's language, there's hope for translation. And with translation, an end, perhaps, to the long twilight of human loneliness, during which time we have known the delights and torments of being uniquely thoughtful, communicative, and self-aware. Before language, even, our artifacts becomes a shared means, inter-individual, by which we can accumulate knowledge of how to make our way in the world. I think that natural evolution of know-how in the co-evolving population of critters is probably going to be more or less expectable. Whether that leads to consciousness or language is a quite another issue. The main reason for considering intelligence as accidental is pretty clear. It's only evolved in one species after four and a half billion years of the history of the Earth, which is about half the Earth's potential history if the sun's due to explode in five billion years or so. That's pretty amazing. There are only 4,000 species of mammals. We're a minor group. Consciousness has only arisen in one species, us, of a minor 
order of mammals, the primates, with fewer than 200 species in total. You have a million named species, including about 500,000 beetles. That is, if intelligence was such a good thing, and it was so obviously of Darwinian benefit, and it was an easy thing to achieve, I assume other lineages would have, and they haven't. And yet they're doing very well. Is intelligent life merely an accident? Popular accounts of science often say so, claiming that life and intelligence are trivial. One scientist called life a fancy kind of rust afflicting the surfaces of certain lukewarm minor planets. Another portrayed humans as scum, a cosmic afterthought, clinging to a small planet in an uncaring universe. But there's a new vision on the horizon, one that sees intelligence as an emergent property, apt to appear on any planet that has a sufficiently complex biological system. The patterns formed by birds in flight and by schools of fish are emergent properties. They can be seen not in individual fish or birds, but only in large assemblages of them. According to this theory, emergent properties can be understood only by studying the system as a whole. The spiral arms of galaxies are fireworks shows created when brilliant young stars are formed by density waves moving across the galactic disk. Millions of stars must be born for the spiral pattern to appear. Weather is an emergent property. A low pressure front is made of molecules of air and water but we cannot perceive it just by looking at individual molecules. Only when we consider the system as a whole does it emerge as a thunderstorm. If intelligence emerges normally in the biospheres of living planets, as naturally as weather patterns emerge in their atmospheres, there may be many thinking beings on other worlds. Science traditionally has concentrated on the parts, the approach known as reductionism. But if intelligence is an emergent property, then it must be studied in the context of life as a whole. A group of musicians who've never previously played together are warming up before their first rehearsal. One musician begins playing a familiar composition. A few others recognize what it is and join in. But the composition becomes fully recognizable to all only when enough musicians are playing together for it to emerge. If intelligence emerged like this, as naturally as clouds gathering to make a storm, then thought may not be incidental to the workings of the material universe, but in some sense the point of it all, the central theme in a cosmic symphony. There's an Islamic saying that three things are known to no man. The hour of his death, the true name of Allah, 
or the source of his next meal. In the Jewish tradition, there's a story of a rabbi who's stopped after curfew by a Cossack who says, where are you going, old man? And answers, I don't know. The Cossack arrests him, and as the door to his cell slams shut, the rabbi says, you see, I told you I didn't know where I was going. It is pretty much our situation as members of an intelligent species who don't know if there are any other intelligent beings out there in the universe. We think it's good to be smart, that it bodes well for our destiny and should for other species too in other worlds. But we don't really know where we're going, do we? Does the fact that humans are intelligent mean that we're likely to survive? Or will we blow ourselves up or pollute the earth so badly that we can no longer live here? Richard Gott and Freeman Dyson are physicists who concern themselves with human destiny. So intelligence doesn't confer any particular propensity toward surviving longer or blowing yourself up sooner. I, I think, un unfortunately, just taking us as the example here, I, my, my guess is that it's similar. I mean, Albert Einstein, he was very smart, but he didn't live orders of magnitude longer than other people. So um, <laughs> what we sort of learned is that smarter species, <laughs> smarter species don't tend to live longer than than other ones. This is, uh, this is an unfortunate thing to notice. <laughs> so, <laughs> one of the things we might like to know about is how long the human race is likely to last. And we can be helped in reasoning about this by using the Copernican principle. Richard Gott has devised a formula for predicting how long the human species is going to last. He begins with the assumption that there's a 95% likelihood that we're living during the middle 95% of humanity's total tenure. To date, Homo sapiens have existed for about 200,000 years. So, there's a 95% chance that you're located in the middle 95% of human history and that therefore the future longevity of the human race is likely to be longer than 5,100 years but less than 7.8 million years. Now, those numbers are interesting because uh, they give us a total longevity that's quite similar to other species. All beings who have learned that the universe is old must also know that by comparison they are young. The longer alien civilizations typically last, the better our chances of communicating with them. The lights on this tree represent technological civilizations that might have arisen in a given galaxy over a period of one million years. The length of time that each light stays on represents the period during which each civilization is willing and able to make radio contact with the inhabitants of other such worlds. If the communicative worlds typically stay on the air for 500,000 years, their persistence is rewarded. Each finds that it has plenty of contemporaries with whom to make radio contact. So if civilizations last a long time, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, is a cinch. But watch what happens if alien civilizations typically last only 100,000 years before they become extinct or lose interest. Now they find that there are only a few worlds on the air at the same time they are. And if they're typically on the air for only 100 years, then each finds itself almost certainly alone. A hundred years is longer than we here on Earth have yet been listening for signals from the stars. So SETI requires that alien radio buffs stay on the air a lot longer than we have. The great void in interstellar communication is not space, but time. There may be creatures out there who live as long as sequoias and reside in cities older than the pyramids, but on the cosmic time scale, even those civilizations are fleeting as fireflies, brief flickers in a wheeling galaxy. What monuments might they have built to leave some trace of themselves in the annals of cosmic history? Perhaps they long ago established a permanent network to link inhabited planets and preserve a record of their histories. If so, the first signal we receive could come from an interstellar internet. Deployed over eons by robotic spacecraft, such a network could bring libraries of information within relatively close reach of emerging worlds like ours. Communication can bridge time as well as space, revealing the histories of societies that disappeared long ago and offering clues to how our species might best navigate its way toward the dim and distant future.
I mean, a species, generally speaking, lasts a few million years. That's sort of typical of a species. And if that's true of our species, well, that's fine. We're in good shape for another million years or so, and, and that would be plenty of time for most people. However, the whole idea of species is, is fading away as soon as you have genetic engineering and genes being transferred from one species to another, which is already happening. But Homo sapiens, unless you think of them as ab abdicating or genetically re-engineering themselves until they're unrecognizable? Or? Yes, I think that we shall probably become many different species if we are species at all in a time that's much shorter than these two million years that you're talking about. And there's just a huge difference between 100 years and a million years. In 100 years, we'll be the same as we are, but in a million years, probably not. Mm -hmm. So we can imagine over billions of years, intelligence has grown and developed far beyond any sort of intelligence we now have, and that it might, in fact, become a major player in the physical development of the universe, reorganizing galaxies to move immense quantities of matter and radiation from one part of the universe to another. We might, in fact, become creators in producing a, a universe in which we can live forever. That's um, at least a dream which is not altogether uh, pointless to think about. We don't know how many alien civilizations exist, or how long they typically last, or how many of them take the trouble to broadcast signals. What if everybody's listening and nobody's sending? Scientists involved in SETI hardly ever transmit anything, either because they probably have to wait decades or centuries to get an answer, or out of fear of betraying our presence to aliens who might, for all we know, be hostile to us. But what if someday we did want to send a message, a powerful message beamed to a planet where we had some reason to expect that there was somebody listening? What would we say? I want to know if they're bad guys or good guys. <laughs> If they're good, we can work with them, right? <laughs> Dear extraterrestrial, please respond to this message by sending a radio signal back on the frequency at which you receive this message, making due allowance, of course, for your emotions around your star. Send that signal at a power level such that it arrives on Earth with at least 10 to the minus 23 watts per square meter. And leave your transmitter running long enough, let's say a few months, so that one of the searches now operating on Earth will receive it. Then we can really get a conversation going. I would say, please forgive us for making so much noise. You know, but talking is what we do all the time. And maybe the reason we don't hear the aliens is because they are different and they keep quiet. What an awesome, self-unfolding, miraculously generative universe we are fortunate enough to share. That's what I would say. What I want to know from you is, what's your biochemistry? I really want to know whether life has to be done through DNA or whether there are lots of other ways that I need another experiment to find out. And the other thing, I will give to you the B minor mass, because that's the best thing we've ever done. But I'd like to know whether you've ever done anything that beautiful, and if so, what was it, and share it with us. Our intelligent species has been around for 200,000 years, and we have spent members of our species to our neighboring moon. And we've learned something of the laws of physics, and we've learned where we are in the universe. How are you doing? Greetings from one of the species that inhabit Earth, a blue planet orbiting an average star. We 
we call ourselves homo sapiens, by which we mean that we're capable of mathematics, science, and the technology by which this message is being sent. We're the only such creatures on this world, and so far as we know, the only ones to have lived here throughout its long history. Science has brought a better life for millions of us, but many more of us still live in poverty, tyranny, and ignorance. Sometimes we wonder if there's intelligent life on Earth. We've only just glimpsed the vastness of time and space and of our own ignorance. We've learned that we have a lot to learn. And so we're dispatching this message in hopes of learning something about you and about ourselves. We request the favor of a reply. To learn more about this program, visit us at PBS Online at the Internet address on your screen. This program was made possible by the Jane and George Russell Fund and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS.